This is the account of Jacob and his family. When Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended his father's flocks. He worked with his half-brothers, the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah. But Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things his brothers were doing. Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children, because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day, Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. But his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word to him. One night, Joseph had a dream. And when he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. Listen to this dream, he said. We were out in the field, tying up bundles of grain. <coughs> Suddenly, my bundle stood up, and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. His brothers responded. So you think you will be our king, do you? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams and the way he talked about them. Soon after this, Joseph's brothers went to pasture their father's flocks at Shechem. When they had been gone for some time, Jacob said to Joseph, your brothers are pasturing the sheep at Shechem. Get ready, and I will send you to them. I'm ready to go, Joseph replied. Go and see how your brothers and their flocks are getting along, Jacob said. Then come back and bring me a report. So Jacob sent him on his way, and Joseph travelled to Shechem from their home in the valley of Hebron. Joseph sold into slavery. When Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they recognized him in the distance. As he approached, they made plans to kill him. Here comes the dreamer, they said. Come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of these systems. We can tell our father, a wild animal has eaten him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. But when Reuben heard of their scheme, he came to Joseph's rescue. Let's not kill him, he said. Why should we shed any blood? Let's just throw him into this empty system here in the wilderness. Then he'll die without our laying a hand on him. Reuben was planning to rescue Joseph and return him <coughs> to his father. So when Joseph arrived, his brothers ripped the beautiful robe he was wearing. Then they grabbed him and threw him into the system. Now the system, shall I just change to a different one? Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain by killing our brother? We'll have to cover up the crime. Instead of hurting him, let's sell him to those Ishmaelite traders. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. And his brothers agreed. So when the Ishmaelites, who were Midianite traders came by, Joseph's brothers pulled him out of the system and sold him to them for 20 pieces of silver, and the traders took him to Egypt. Sometime later, Reuben returned to get Joseph out of the system. When he discovered that Joseph was missing, he tore his clothes in grief. Then he went back to his brothers and lamented, the boy is gone, what will I do now? Then the brothers killed a young goat and dipped Joseph's robe in its blood. They sent the beautiful robe to their father with this message. Look at what we found. Doesn't this robe belong to your son? Their father recognized it immediately. Yes, he said, it is my son's robe. A wild animal must have eaten him. Joseph has clearly been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes and dressed himself in burlap. He mourned deeply for his son for a long time. His family all tried to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. 
I will go to my grave mourning for my son, he would say. And then he would weep. Meanwhile, the Midianite traders arrived in Egypt where they sold Jesus to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and the king of Egypt. Potiphar was captain of the palace guard. Okay, so we have, for the children, or anyone really, a power station recharge. We've got a colouring activity this week, if anybody would like to go over to the corner. I think Joseph might be going, right, if you want to meet Joseph. So if you want to go over to that corner, and Guy is going to give us a message. So I'm just going to say a quick prayer for Guy and for the children. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time that Shirley has put into this uh, preparation, and that Guy has uh, put into his preparation. I'd ask that you would bless the conversations that happen over at that table. And I'd ask that um, you would help Guy now, help him to speak clearly, and also prepare our hearts to listen. Challenge us with what you have to bring us this morning. Amen. Excellent, good. Thank you everybody for um, all the stuff you've done. Thank you, Cecilia, for leading us so well. Um, so we're on week two of our Summer of Superheroes, where we're exploring superheroes of the faith. And as you've seen so far today, it's Joseph and endurance. I wonder what the word endurance means for you. I wonder if you've been through seasons in your life where you've had to endure things. I remember as a young lad, my first experience of endurance was at school. And like many schools back then, uh, they used to get you to do cross-country running. Now, it actually happened to be that I was actually quite good at middle distance running. And so our school was selected um, to go for the trials, the national championship trials, and uh, up in the, the Northwest. And so first of all, we had to qualify from a Northwest perspective, and then all the sort of regions then um, would race off. And so our school, was asked to send uh, about 30 students forward. Um, I was one of them, two age brackets. And for each age bracket, I think there were about three or 400 children competing in each of those age brackets. So I was asked to go along, and uh, I can remember running this, and for the first you know, mile or so, I think it was about a five mile race, um, and I think it was the under 16s slot that I was in, or under 15, something like that. And uh, anyway, so I started off running, and after about the first mile, I thought, heck, this is a bit fast. <laughs> These runners are obviously really, really quite good. And uh, so mile two came, and mile three came, and I was thinking, I really don't know if I've got much more left in me. And then about two thirds of the way around, I remember my PE teacher had run across the, the woods to a particular point to have a word with me. So I was running around, and he suddenly shouted at me. And uh, basically the qualifying was, I think 15, uh, the top 15 of this race of 300 or so, were able to then qualify for the national championships. And uh, so my PE teacher jumped out of a bush and shouted at me, Guy, you're only five off qualifying. So I didn't have a clue at this time. So anyway, I was feeling absolutely shattered. So it's like, off we go. So, um, so basically, yeah, I, I just put on the gas and kept running. I didn't think I had anything left in me. And I was running and I was counting them by. That's the fifth person, the fourth person, the third person, the second person. And then I could see the person who I needed to be. And I was about 200 meters from the, from the finish line. And I just put this sprint on. And I sprinted, and I don't know where it came from. I sprinted, I sprinted. And the poor chap, I literally went over the, the line about three feet in front of him. He didn't know I was coming. He didn't know I was coming. He'd probably sped up. But that was it. I qualified for these national championships. And I was like, really great. I mean, apart from the fact when I got over the line, I collapsed and was sick everywhere. <laughs> not, not my best moment. Uh, but nonetheless, that was it. And then, um, unfortunately, a few days later, the school got a phone call to say that the race was going to have to get re rerun because some people had cheated and they couldn't work out who it was that cheated. And so they were going to rerun the race in a week's time or so, and I had to do that right, so I couldn't do it, so. Oh. <laughs> but uh, that was my first experience of uh, endurance. It was, um, 
yeah, enduring, should we say, really, really tough. So let's look at this story of Joseph then. And as we've seen some superhero stats, as we do with you know, um, all these messages over these six weeks, we're just going to tell you a potted history of the particular superhero of the faith. So we know uh, from the Bible that roughly he was born 1914 BC, so that's roughly 2,000 years before Christ, and incidentally about 400 years after the flood. And we know that Joseph lived to 110. His father was Jacob, who was also referred to as Israel, and Je uh, Joseph's mother was Rachel. He was one of 12 brothers, and the reason why you hear the way that the, um, well, there was 12 of them, so you had 11 brothers, the reason why in the bereaving that you hear the word 10 is because his youngest brother, Benjamin, presumably was too young to be out in the fields at that particular point. And in the family, Jacob, his father, had four wives. Um, so Joseph was born um, to Rachel, and Benjamin was also born to Rachel. Um, he had at least one sister, we don't get to know uh, much about that sister, and later on he was married to Asenath and had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, if that's how you pronounce his son. And the interesting thing is that the story of Joseph covers about 25% of Genesis, and there are 50 chapters in Genesis, and so this really covers quite a big proportion, and in fact, Genesis 37 isn't the first time we hear about Joseph, uh, we hear about his birth in Genesis 30. So Joseph was 17 years old when this main part of the story um, starts, and I think just as we saw with the soundtrack, I didn't know that Cecilia was going to do this during the challenge, um, he was known for his coat of many colours, and probably out of all the Bible stories, because of the musical, Joseph and his amazing technical dream coat, probably one of the more well-known uh, Bible stories um, by Christians and Christians alike. So let's get into some aspects of the story. And as I've said, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot going on here. It was a long reading. We've only covered a small part of it. And so we've obviously got chapters 37 to 50, which I'm not going to go into in detail. You'll be pleased to know. But we are just going to pick out on some of the endurance markers which make Joseph special for his superpower of endurance. So, first of all, we read at 17 years old, um, and we the first endurance marker that I would set out here is that we read from the narrative that Joseph grew up being hated by his, his brothers. So that can't have been easy, can it? It's all your brothers hating you. And this was because he was dad's favourite, um, also because he would tell dad of some of the bad things, um, so if you like, he grasped on them, uh, and that probably um, didn't put him in much favour. Um, but also there's this fact that he was a dreamer, and we read, don't we, that just a couple of the dreams uh, that he had were relayed through. So the second endurance marker I'm putting in there is his dreaming, one might say, a visionary one might say, a misunderstood prophet. So I don't know if anyone here today fits in that camp, I don't know if you're a visionary, whether you're a dreamer, and whether you're greatly misunderstood. The third mark of endurance is when he's out in the fields and they capture him, as we read, and he gets chucked down a, a cistern or a well. And um, that can't have been very pleasant. I would imagine it was quite smelly down there, it would have been quite dark, and incredibly frightening. Can you imagine having all your brothers gang up on you and then lob you down a well, which must have hurt in itself, and then not knowing what on earth is going to happen? So there was a period of endurance while he was in that well, thinking, what will happen to me? And then the next endurance marker, where these Ishmaelite traders come and he's sold into slavery. Now the distance that he travelled will have been about 360 miles. I'm not sure how many miles a day this camel train would have done. I 
can't imagine it being particularly quick. Can you imagine getting dragged through the desert from Canaan to Egypt, tied up, probably really thirsty, really hungry, and quite scared as well? So that's the fourth endurance marker that I've got from this story. Now the fifth one is the bit that we didn't read because it then goes into um, more of chapter 39 actually. And we read that when he gets to Egypt, he's bought by Potiphar. And Potiphar is captain of the Pharaoh's guard. So you've got to get yourself into the scene here. Egypt at this point is a superpower probably the superpower of the world at that time. So Potiphar, being in charge of the palace guard, was an important person. And so Joseph um, ended up um, serving in the household of Potiphar. And we read from the narrative that Potiphar realises that God is with Joseph and that everything he does, he succeeds in. Potiphar recognises this, and so Potiphar then makes Joseph head of his household. What an absolute blessing. And then one day we read that Joseph is a handsome, a well-built man. And as it's a family service, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but should we just say Potiphar's wife had needs. <laughs> yeah. And Joseph was not prepared to meet those needs. He would have been under all sorts of temptation. So again, we see incredible godliness here and standing out and saying, no, I'm not going to be sucked in to that temptation. So we read that then Potiphar's wife gets the, gets the hump for being rejected and um, she makes an accusation against Joseph and Joseph gets thrown into jail. And while he's in jail, and this is one of the bits we don't really pick up, but he's actually in jail for a good few years. We don't realise this, it's not just a quick thing. He's in jail for at least two years, if not three years. And during that time, some of Pharaoh's attendants also are in jail and they have some dreams. And Joseph interprets those dreams. And then later on, one of those people dies, gets executed by Pharaoh, but the other one stays in the service of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh has some dreams. And he says, who can interpret these dreams for me? And this particular person who uh, went back into the Pharaoh's service, said, I know a guy in jail, and he will be able to interpret these dreams. And so he's sure, sure thing, sure thing that he does. He interprets Pharaoh's dreams, and Pharaoh is really, really pleased. But it's at this point where Pharaoh makes Joseph now the number two in the whole of Egypt. So if you imagine a cabinet office, think of our cabinet office for today, the equivalent is Joseph, Joseph is in charge of the money, he's in charge of the home defence, he's also in charge of aspects of the foreign army as well that would go out, so a little bit of a foreign, foreign secretary as well, and all the, the home affairs um, of Egypt. In fact, he's put in charge of the nation of Egypt. But he's still in slavery, and we read at this point now he's 30 years old, so get this, 17 to 30, he has been nearly half of his life in slavery. Now I could preach a separate um, topic on modern day slavery, which is now worse than it has ever, ever been. It's horrendous. But anyway, Joseph suffered this. Joseph was in slavery. And he was in charge um, for Pharaoh, as I say, of the whole of Egypt. And in line with the interpretation of the dreams, sure enough, the seven years of plenty comes. So the seven years of amazing harvest. And Joseph, who's in charge of this now, does what is uh, sensible using his organisation and administration skills. And they make sure that they store all the grain over these seven years, because guess what? Seven years of famine is coming, which was predicted in the dream that's there. And sure enough, that happens. And during this time, we, we read that Joseph gets, gets married and he has children. So we fast forward now to chapters 42 to 50. And this is in the famine. So this is where 
the land and the whole nations around, as far as Canaan and beyond, are literally starving. And so Jacob and the brothers decide that they need food. So 10 of the brothers, that's without Benjamin, go to Egypt and go and beg for food. And they don't recognize Joseph. And guess what? Joseph's dream comes true. They bow down in front of Joseph, begging for grain. And Joseph plays a little trick on them. And this is the sort of main story of Joseph and his technical dream, dream code. And so what Joseph does is he fills their sacks up with grain, um, but he also secretly puts the money that they've used to pay for the grain back in the tops of the sacks. And he sends the brothers away, back to, back to Jacob, and he says, don't you come back to me unless you bring your youngest brother. So off they go, and partway through, they open the sacks and they realise that they have this grain for free, and they're puzzled. So Joseph has blessed them. They go back to Jacob and then they need more food. So they then come back to Egypt with the youngest brother, Benjamin. And Joseph still hasn't revealed who he is. They then play, he plays another trick on them, fills the, the grain sacks up, but this time puts a silver goblet in the top of Benjamin's sack and let them get so far away and then the guard comes, arrests them and finds this silver goblet in Benjamin's sack. And they're then a threat of arrest and prison. And it's at this point that Joseph reveals his identity. Now the last point of endurance that I want to give you on this is you might think that with all this wealth and with all this power and seemingly Joseph's life has turned all the way around, you might think that he's really happy. But we read a couple of things which really give us an indication the impact of this slavery and importantly the family separation. And this is, to me, is one of the saddest bits of the story. We get a lens on how Joseph is really feeling. And we get this in a couple of readings. In Genesis 41, Joseph named his older son Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my troubles and everyone in my father's family. Joseph named his second son Ephraim, because he said, God has made me fruitful in the land of my grief. That's the true lens that Joseph was in. Despite all this power and prosperity, he was heartbroken. We read in Genesis 45, this is when he reveals who he is to his brothers. And it says, Joseph could stand it no longer. There were many people in the room. And he said to his attendants, out all of you. So he was alone with his brothers when he told them who he was and then he broke down and wept. And he wept so loudly the Egyptians could hear him and word of it carried quickly to Pharaoh's palace. This was a guy who was broken. This was a guy who had been through mental trauma. Probably had PTSD. And this is a part of the story that we don't get out. The, the Tim Rice and Andrew Lloyd Webber, it's all very happy and jolly, isn't it? But can you imagine yourself enduring that slavery for nearly 15 years? Like 15 years or more, actually. It's a big deal, isn't it? So, well done, Joseph, for getting through this. And the superhero lessons that I'm going to pull out about this endurance is the first one. And I'm going to say this now to everybody in particular who's 25 years or younger. Endurance uh, in terms of there is purpose in your plans. I want to say to you that if you've got dreams for the rest of your life, if there's things that you want to do and you'll know that they're aligned with God's will, you go for it and you don't let anybody tell you different. I can remember the careers advice I got at school was horrendous times. I got told what I couldn't do. I wanted to be a marine biologist originally and because I wasn't going to be able to qualify for the top five universities in England, my school basically went pretty much like that at times. That's, that's how it felt. 
And so that dream went. God had better plans for me. But at that point, that was, that was my dream that I love to see. And I wonder today, what's your dream? What's your dream for the future? Similarly, if you're somebody who God talks to you in dreams, again, a massive sermon on this, what I will say is, pay attention to your dreams. Pay attention to your dreams. Because the dreams that feel a bit daft, where all sorts of stuff happens, there's lots of lessons to be learned there, because clearly your brain has been receiving a lot of signals, and your brain is just sorting those signals out. So if you find your dreams being a little bit weird, let's say not very nice, let's say a little bit naughty, I'd question, watch what you watch. If you have the sort of dreams that actually are not daft, and actually God talks to you in dreams, please, please, please tell us about them. It's really, really important. And if you've got dreams for the rest of your life in terms of what you're going to do, then follow those dreams. The second bit of endurance is endurance through my problems and pain. This is really important, and I could talk for a long time on that. But just this week, I had this lovely card from somebody. She knows who she is. And a lovely, lovely word for us in our period of endurance currently for Hazel and myself. Absolutely wonderful, a real blessing. And again, what I would say to you is exactly what's on that card. God is with you. God is with you. When you're going through problem and pain, he's not over there somewhere. You can cry out to him right where you are. And the third superhero lesson is purpose in his plans. So the first one was purpose in your plans, but we shouldn't forget that God has a big picture. God's a big picture. Isn't it interesting that in this story, the brothers were heartbroken because they thought they had caused this. They thought they had brought calamity on Joseph. But can you see what God was doing? If Joseph hadn't, if that hadn't happened to him, and he hadn't have gone to Egypt, and he hadn't risen in the ranks and become Pharaoh's number two, and acted in obedience on the dreams and storing all that grain up, then Jacob's family would have starved to death. So can you see that despite what we think is going on in this earthly realm, there was way more going on in the heavenlies. Never forget, especially if you feel things aren't quite going your way, or your problems and pain, never forget there is purpose in his plans. So as we wrap up, a little reading each week, we're giving a reading of an encouragement. And this is from Romans 5, 3 to 4. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us, because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. So your superhero challenge for this week. If you are someone who is going through endurance at this time, I'm going to encourage you to do these three things. Talk, walk, and pray. Talk. Oh, nearly did my 20 minute timer. I'm doing 20 minute timers. There we go. About 30 seconds of drift. Talk to somebody. Tell them that you're going through this stuff. Don't do it on your own. Number two, walk. Walk with them. Let them walk with you. Boots on the ground. And thirdly, soak in prayer. So if you're going through endurance, then this week, I'd love you to do this. To tell somebody about it, to talk, to walk, and to pray. And let's see where this gets to.